there's a moment here where PETA comes back and Jen and PETA kiss for the first time. And I remember one of the times because she was crying, there was this huge glob of snot that was like <laughs> connected. Who's between, snot? I think her. And were you always totally on board with splitting them into two films? I mean, some some series have gotten flack no. over the years, but oh yeah, ours got flack. Yeah. I was I was not a big fan of doing it. I w- wished that we would have done just one complete movie. Right. I think what I feel is left on the table is we really are going to be able to do the R-rated version of Constantine. The like more sort of truthful, honest, you know, scary. Like if it was if I was going to get an R, yeah. I would have made it an R-rated movie. <laughs> Prepare your ears, humans. Happy, Sad, Confused begins now. I'm Josh Horowitz, and this is a Happy, Sad, Confused watch along. What are we watching today? We're watching the movie that gave us a kick-ass Jennifer Lawrence and a sugar cube peddling Sam Claflin. It is The Hunger Games catching fire. We're watching it with the director, Francis Lawrence. Francis, it's been a while. Are you ready to do this? I'm ready to do this. About a decade has passed. Is this going to be pleasurable or painful to relive Catching Fire? Uh, It's going to be pleasurable, I think. It's been a long time since I've seen it, so it'll be good. Good attitude. Yes. Uh, Here we go, guys. Don your wetsuit, get your trident, your bow and arrow, do what you have to do. Had you been up for the first one? Gary Ross, of course, directed the first one. Were you ever even in the mix to talk about it or not really? You know, it, the idea was floated by me and I had read the, the, the books and really liked them. Um, or actually I'd read uh, Hunger Games. I don't think all the books were out yet. And my worry at the time was getting the PG-13 rating because it was so violent. And so that kind of scared me off as did the sort of the the budget. I think they wanted to make it for a very um, responsible amount. (laughs) And the building of the world that worried me for the amount I heard they wanted to spend. So I I have to say I was scared off and I did not engage at all. So I I can't say I was actually in the running, but it definitely was sort of crossed my desk. It is a remark. I mean, we'll, we'll get into this as we watch, like a remarkable film to see in retrospect of like how it played to such a wide audience and a, and a young audience. And it's, well, it has action. It's really a kind of a political thriller. As you say, it's about PTSD, really weighty themes, a lot of like just deep dialogue scenes just for an $865 million movie. It just, it's very unusual in that respect. It is. And I have, I have to say, I think we all felt really lucky to be a part of this series. And I still do feel lucky to be a part of the series because you know, these these movies are really and stories are really about something. Yeah. And so to kind of hide these thematic character stories in what feels like spectacle uh, was really exciting. And so for it to have the reach that that they did was really gratifying. You inherit this amazing cast. Yeah. What was it like to kind of like join midstream and kind of have to win? Did you feel like you had to kind of win their trust? You know, I did. I definitely did. I was nervous about it. I mean, I certainly... I, I didn't know many of the people that were in the cast personally. Um, and when I got the job, you know, I was going to have to reach out to everybody and get together or call them or whatever and and sort of introduce myself and run them through my approach to the movie because it was going to be different than, than the first film. Um, and I have to say, everybody was was great you know uh, i think the first person who actually reached out to me was elizabeth banks and she and i got together um at a restaurant in here in la and you know she's like all right so what's the deal what are we doing what's the approach you know we chatted that was great i talked to jen i think she was in prague making a movie so we spoke on the phone a few times and then when she's back in town had breakfast i met josh for lunch and met liam and sort of ran through everybody the one person who was a little tricky was Woody. Really? And Woody, and and I don't mean it in a bad way, but Woody wa- is a very, very loyal person. And I think yep. Woody signed on because he really entrusted his role and his time spent in the stories to Gary. And so then a new director was sort of forced upon him. He didn't know me. And he just voiced his concern. And he wasn't just willing to sort of trust blindly so I actually went to New York and spent three days basically with Woody. Woody was directing a play that was in New York. He was living on the Upper West Side somewhere in a, in a brownstone. It was boiling hot, I remember. And Woody is 
entirely anti air conditioning. <laughs> so I remember going up and spending time. It was really fun because he's a great guy. But I just remember like dripping in sweat in this apartment because it was like 90 degrees, super humid, no AC. Um, but anyway, I had to do like spend real time with with Woody to get him to see that, you know, I'm really thinking about the characters and thinking about him and that I'm, you know, r responsible and not an asshole. And, right. You know, um, I think of all the people that I inherited for this for this movie, I was the most nervous to meet Donald um, just because of his experience and the sort of gravitas that he carries. Uh, but we had an amazing first meeting. I remember he wanted to meet. It was July 4th, um, 2012. And he wanted to meet at 9 a.m. at the Pacific Dining Car. And I'm going to reveal something that might get him in trouble with his wife. But he and I met and he decided he wanted to have steak for breakfast. So we had these <laughs> giant New York steaks and coffee for breakfast. Amazing. But he said his wife would kill him if he knew, if she knew <laughs> that we were having these giant New York steaks for breakfast. But... But we had a we had a great time, and I think this was actually the first scene that we shot with Donald, and it was a big scene, and it sort of vacillated in page count in various drafts of the movie. There was a, a time where the scene was only about one and a half pages long, which would be under two minutes long in theory, to a version that was I think six and a half seven pages that we ended up shooting, and then it was sort of cut down to the scene, which I think is around four minutes long or something. But The heights of her fame, this was probably, the, this is like apex Jennifer Lawrence. I mean, she's been riding it out for another 10 years, still at the height, but like. Yeah, I mean, she certainly was famous. Um, but I will say that I think there was, there was a time, it was basically right around when Catching Fire was released that I think she hit. Yeah. I think that's where the her frenzy was really, insane. really changed. Yeah. And there was a mass frenzy because she had also won the Academy Award. Right. Didn't she win she it like won. towards the end of the shoot? She won. So we went back after New Jersey. We went back for two more weeks in Hawaii because we didn't finish Hawaii, which we can get into later. Yep. Because um, we were doing IMAX and right. it was tougher than everybody thought. So we went back and it was the Sunday before we started shooting again in Hawaii. She won the Academy Award and we had a Academy Award watch party. Nice. For her in the hotel. So where the sort of, you know, traveling crew got together and and watched her fall on the stairs. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> was paparazzi all over you guys? Like yes. In, yeah. 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 Less less so, I think, in the shooting, for the most part, in shooting Catching Fire. Um, paparazzi actually shot, when Jen and I first met for breakfast in Santa Monica, I remember there was shots that somebody got of us waiting for our cars uh, at the end of breakfast. Yeah, sorry about that. I just saw you guys. I had a long lens. I figured I should, yes. you know, make some extra money. Yes. Um, but then I think for the most part, they left us alone in Atlanta. And then there was um, a bit of a paparazzi presence in Hawaii, certainly in certain areas where it was more accessible. So I think her connection with PETA from the first games, a lot of it is sort of like trauma bonding, right? right. They're going through these horrible things together. You kind of bond and then you go back home, right? And you kind of want to forget what happened in the games. And so, you know, the idea that PETA gets sort of pushed aside and she goes back to the person she shares the life experience with at home, Gail. And then this is that kind of, you know, trying to sort of come back together. They're both going to have to sort of experience this tour um, or the games again. And that kind of trauma bonds them once again. I always thought the scenes like I'm really happy with the way this sequence yeah, turned out with the, the emotional, speeches and yeah. emotional and with the old man and bringing in that James Newton Howard score just at yes, the right time. Yeah. The right yeah, theme. It, it and, yeah. And then also just crazy how this, you know, this symbol, right, of the salute oh, yeah. started to kind of carry around the world and was ended up, you know, being used by sort of groups protesting in Southeast Asia. And really incredible to see the reach of the sort of symbols in the movie. Yeah. I mean, you must. Do you still feel it like when when people recognize you or know that you've done these films? Um yeah, this is this is one of those series of films that really had a, a lasting impact on a kind of a generation, truly. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, every once in a while, you know, you hear about how important these movies were to somebody at a certain point in their life, um, which is which is impactful for me. I, I, I also remember at the end when we finished the Mockingjay movies and part of, the, I think, the last press tour was that they had opened a Hunger Games Museum. 
and I think it started in Times Square. And so we had this opening, and I remember me and Jen and Josh and Liam and Nina, the producer, toured it for the first time. And when you hear the music and you yeah. see the pictures of the sets and the locations and you get the costumes and the props and the interactive displays and, you know, there's something kind of incredibly moving about having worked on something and created something that's like deserving of a museum. Yeah. So that that was pretty incredible. Jen, I, as you well know, as I've experienced, is such like a fun human being to be around. And this film, like talk about like an, a true acting performance. Like she's not, she barely cracks a smile in this film. This is like, this is a damaged woman that's really totally. holding on by a thread. Yes. Was it tough on her? Like, do you remember, like, is no. she able to kind of turn it on and off? A hundred percent. She can turn it on and off. Uh, and um, I think, you know, because I did four movies with her, I will say that by the time I did the last one with her, which was Red Sparrow, tougher scenes did become tougher for her. Mm. Um, but here, I think she was 21 years old. And she could turn it on and off with a switch. And I think it drove some other actors, not this group, but some other actors kind of crazy because it was easy for her. <laughs> <laughs> and like, come on, really? yeah, that drove people, some people nuts. That's and that because she could be joking around and laughing and yep. being really silly, and then you're like, say action, and she just becomes entirely present. Yep. Um, it's really an amazing thing to watch. It's a really incredible thing to watch. One of like I would say a handful of directors that's often talked about like you know the cliches world building, which yes. is like and, and truly like without blowing smoke, like you do it. At a very high level and like not many filmmakers can do that is that something you relish 100 uh, percent. yeah i honestly i think it's it's one of the most important factors for me in deciding to take on a job and honestly it was one of the big sort of deciding factors for me taking this job because i would probably not have done it if i was just gonna if i was inheriting a cast and entirely inheriting a world that i couldn't expand upon right but I knew in reading the book again that I could I could change and tweak the capital and see something new. I could see more of District 12 and make that more expansive. I had an entirely new arena that I could I could work on. So I think we're oh my nearing God. a big introduction. Yeah, Phil Hoffman, which uh, I definitely want to talk to you a lot about. Phil. Yeah. I mean, so he obviously enters the franchise with this film. Um, how did it happen? Was it did it t was it tough to get Phil on board? I mean, he was not somebody that did a lot of blockbusters of he, this type. He did not. No, I wouldn't say that it was tough. But I remember that when I read it and I signed on, that he was my first choice to play Plutarch. And Nina and Suzanne and I all went to New York and saw him in Death of a Salesman. I saw that production. And amazing, we yeah. Re yeah, we reached out. He was amazing in it. And we reached out to him and his reps said, you know, he really doesn't want to engage in anything until he's finished because it was, you know, that was taking a toll. And he decided to do it. We had a small window here on Catching Fire. I think he was in around for maybe three weeks. First of all, that must have been a, a good day when you hear Phil was on board. Yeah, That's... for sure. Everybody was really excited. <laughs> Everybody was really, really, really excited. Jen was, Donald was, because Donald was going to have a bunch of scenes with him. Yep. Super, super excited. This was a really tough scene. This is probably one of the toughest scenes I've ever had to shoot. Why is that? Well, you know, they're supposed to be dancing. And, you know, not like anything really choreographed, but we did get somebody to sort of teach them how to basically rotate. Um, but Phil didn't want to dance. And so they're just standing there kind of rocking back and forth <laughs> and to make it feel like they're dancing we have to have the the steady cam operator uh, my operator I work with all the time Dave Thompson do circles around them it was it was it was really interesting I have to say I mean you know Phil was going through some stuff right um, and none of us knew it and so as excited as we all were it was he remained a bit of an outsider on this shoot and it was I have you know, to be honest, a little bit of a bummer. And, but when the movie was finished and he saw the movie, uh, he really, really, really loved it. Like he was so excited about it. Um, and sort of the personality completely changed yep. 
with me, with everybody. And well, he I'll, probably had his, I mean, whatever personal stuff he was going through, but he also probably had, he was a true artist and had his guards up and like, I'm joining this franchise. Like, is this the right yes, thing? And like, it's weird. And it was weird for him because, you know, like his, I think his first day actually was in the control room. So he's wearing, you know, this weird, slightly, let's say sci-fi kind of outfit. Um, I don't remember what color it is, but you know, it's weird. And then you walk into this control room right. and I think he's feeling, was feeling very unmoored emotionally. Yeah. And, and I have found over the years too, that often, especially great actors and actors who've had a ton of experience, and especially if they're only going to do two or three weeks on your movie, come in, um, and are definitely at arm's length, unless you know them, because they have to see like, am I going to be monitoring and policing myself or am I going to put my trust into this person? And the truth is we didn't have long enough to sort of to build trust. So yep. it was really the result um, of the object of the movie in the end that sort of bonded, bonded us and, and honestly bonded um, Phil with everybody else in the cast, too. And the experience, I mean, again, not to on all the sadness but it was during Mockingjay that he passed yes. I believe right yes. so he didn't quite finish that no shooting, he had but... he had eight days left on the Mockingjay movies yeah and so, significant scenes too not not just sort of appearances and scenes he had I think he had three significant dialogue scenes left I can't imagine the challenge as a filmmaker you've just lost somebody that you're you know you bonded with as an artist and a friend and you also have the challenge of I also have to finish my my damn movie and make yeah it work. which is a uh, which which is a a bit of a mind fuck, right? Because there's the the work side of you that's like, yeah, we have to do this. But you know, I had at that point you're morning, you're, lost yeah. um, a friend, yeah. a colleague, um, a, as as did the entire crew and the cast. So there's a it was a really rough um, time getting wind in our sails again on the Mockingjays. And, you know, it happened in, in February and we didn't wrap the Mockingjay movies. I think it was until July. And, you know, we took some time off. And then when we started, we started with small scenes with like Jen and Liam without any extras. And we slowly started sort of reintroducing cast members again. And, and everybody, as they came back, had to kind of go through their sort of reentry process because everybody was really feeling it. But I will say, too, that I probably learned the most about acting, working with him. And just in the end, just sort of talking about stuff and really drilling down on scenes and characters and what's like what's under everything in a scene and really watching and working with him and seeing him actually be, be able to change the approach to scenes was such an education. If anyone knows anything about me, Josh Horowitz, you know I love to eat. I don't necessarily love to shop or cook. That's why I'm thrilled that our sponsor on Happy Sad Confused is HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. You can skip those trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. With the holidays right around the corner, guys, HelloFresh can help you take the stress out of dinner by delivering everything you need to cook up tasty meals right to your door, saving you tons of time and tons of money, by the way. This season can be hectic. That's where HelloFresh's 15-minute meals come in. These quick fixes help you get a wholesome meal on the table in less time than it would take you to even choose a delivery service, let alone get one. I know from experience, my wife and I cook together. We've made pork chops, pasta, burgers with HelloFresh, and it's all easy, fresh, and delicious. Go to HelloFresh.com slash HSC free and use that code HSC free for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while your subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash HSC free. And remember to use that code HSC free. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. So Chad, who we were talking about earlier off camera. Oh, Chad Stahelski. Yep. This is uh, like one of the only sort of second unit sequences that um, Chad, who oh, was wow. our Stahelski, was our second unit um, and stunt coordinator, did this 
did the sequence. I don't remember what like we were off pillaging. doing when he was doing this. Yes, mm -hmm. but peacekeepers pillaging and burning and Chad will do that. Chad can do that. And the flamethrowers <laughs> here in the hob. Is that tough to to give like to like entrust a second unit director to a hundred percent leap of faith, right? It's, yes, a hundred a hundred percent. And I think part of it is. You can talk all you want about, you know, the story points and how things should feel. Um, but also, I think because I think very visually that, you know, it's hard to see somebody else's interpretation of what's going to be a part of, you know, my my movie. But Chad did a he did a great job with that bit. Um, I don't remember what movie it was on. I actually think that it was on the Mockingjays, but Woody actually played this great um, joke on me. He did it on other people, but I definitely fell for it where he had. Woody's always getting into like sort of accidents. So he showed up one time on one of the movies and half his body was all like shredded and what? he had like fallen out of a tree or something. <laughs> and, and there was like, he had been in like a kite surfing accident. Sure. So he was always had some kind of injury <laughs> and he was also always riding his bike. He did a lot of cycling and I was at dinner one night and he sent me a picture and his whole face was all bloody and and he said he had been cycling and slipped and fell without wearing a helmet in gravel and he called me up and he sounded out of it and i was telling him he's got to go to a hospital and he's like but what are we going to do i shoot tomorrow i'm like we'll figure it out man. we'll figure it out you just get to a hospital <laughs> what i didn't know is he had actually hired our makeup effects crew to come over to his house and they spent like four hours doing all wow. this makeup that's commitment on him. to the con that's really yes. admirable in a way and he spent you know i don't know a few hours calling everybody he knew <laughs> and telling him he'd been horribly injured in a bicycling accident well that means you did you break you broke through he clearly considered you a friend if he was willing to fuck with you in that way <laughs> <laughs> that and I think if I remember right, I, I may have been the only person to tell him to go to the hospital and wasn't thinking, just thinking about. I think he was expecting me to be worried more about the shoot than oh, his so health. You passed. You you did it right. So, what kind of direction does Jen generally need, if at all? Like, what do you find yourself giving her notes on? Um, usually, you know. Usually I try to orient her in the script. I will say in my experience, Jen um, is not a big study of scripts that <laughs> she usually has read the script once, maybe twice, you know, she signs on and then she'll probably read um, whatever draft is getting shot. But usually for almost any given scene, she's not even aware of what you're doing the day until the morning of. Oh, wow. And so she'll she's look acting at the on instinct. She just needs to know, where was I? Where am I going? So usually what's... I'll do that kind of work yeah. for her where I sort of orient her into reminding her what's happened before, what needs to happen to you know help with what's, what's ahead, all of that. And I will say 97% of the time, She's sort of dead on and her instincts are kind of right. Occasionally she'll start up and she'll go in a direction that's not bad, but maybe wrong narratively. Sure. And then you just kind of reorient her. Um, but, you know, all, all actors are different, you know, and talking about the different personalities like where Jen, because she's sort of so instinctual and it's all very immediate for her. She's usually really good immediately um, because I think the newer the scene um the better it kind of works for her, the more sort of in it she can feel. And the more you do it, the longer it goes, the more takes. I think she starts to kind of wear out. It becomes boring. Yep. And it goes away. But people like Phil Hoffman, he actually uses sort of early takes kind of like rehearsal too, since we don't have a huge rehearsal process on these movies. And so he's usually better. He's drilling like, down. He's, good. he's sometimes 10 takes in. Yeah. Where you finally lock in. Um, and so it's always interesting trying to find a balance with people that are like good out of the gate versus people that want to kind of keep grinding away at it. I think I can now make a guess on what actors may be resented Jen's ability just to turn it on. Not him, off. no, because he has <laughs> enough experience. It, that was there's there's uh, you know a few actors in the Mockingjay movies. Okay. I won't name them because I mean I like them, but I could see <laughs> that it like really yeah yeah. Um, also because Jen is, you know so fun to be around and really jokes around and with everybody and i think some people want to like be silent yeah yeah <laughs> and like think and think <laughs> about the, what, what they're think gonna over do. here and get, yeah. yes have you re kind of now that you've kind of you've directed another hunger Games story that focuses on the backstory of this character have yeah. you kind of like 
I don't know, you must have a, a great, a different appreciation of snow. Um, I, I do. I mean, I obviously knew, you know, snow, I didn't know his entire backstory. I mean, that was obviously not told to us when we were doing these movies, but I sort of understood, um, snow's kind of philosophical underpinnings. So it's nice having done the new movie. That's all about him becoming the man we're familiar with and kind of seeing what that process was like for, for him in getting him to think the way, the way he thinks. One of the great things, and I mean, this is always an approach I, I try to take, but something that Donald did was Donald and I never tried to judge the character, right? You know, because he is truly the antagonist of the first three books and four movies. Um, and so lots of people may think he's very villainous and evil. And the truth is, is Donald and I and all of our conversations never thought of him that way, right? You have to kind of think of villains of as the heroes of their own stories and sure. he has a real belief system um, based on certain philosophies which makes him believe that people have to be ruled this way yeah as opposed to doing it just for power or just for evil did you encourage tom your 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 young snow to look at donald's performance or no you know i mean i wasn't going to stop him from watching and i'm sure he went back and watched all these movies um what we specifically talked about was not trying to mimic Donald, not trying to speak just like him, not trying to move just like him, not looking at like young Donald, you know, movies and things. Um, just we because didn't want that to would do like that. box yeah. him into something. That's... Yeah. And I didn't want it to feel like he was doing an imitation of somebody, right. you know, I just wanted him to, to, you know, play the character. Do you see any similarities? Obviously Rachel Zegler's her, her own woman similarities between her and, and Jen in some ways as your female protagonist? No. I think that the character, and I don't mean that personally, I yeah. just mean like the characters are so wildly different. Yeah. Um, you know, Kat, Katniss, I mean, they're both survivors and they're both smart, but other than that, there's really not much that sort of connects them, you know? Like yeah. Katniss is, you know, um, like a provider for the family and can hunt and is sort of so physically kind of capable and is very stoic. I mean, I will say too, probably, you know, seems kind of somewhat asexual almost mm -hmm. in that, you know, there's not much use of her sexuality um, as, a, as a character, whereas like Rachel's character is, you know, not stoic and quiet, um, doesn't seem to be a big thinker, but is, but just, you know, much more of a performer, uses her charisma, uses her charm, uses her sexuality has a different kind of damage, I think, than Katniss. So very, very different kinds of characters. So we haven't talked about kind of like the, I mean, you alluded to this, but the choice in a, a different aesthetic, a different, you know, you're, you're not doing shaky cam like Gary did in the first one. Was that a big, big choice? Did you ever consider being a little bit more consistent with the visual style of the first one? I, I, I did I did not. I mean, I so, you know, one of the things, it's, it's weird because it's a big job to get. But I have to say, going in for my meetings and pitching what I would do was probably the least nervous I've ever been when having to pitch somebody in hopes of getting a job. And I think it was just, it was honestly, it was down to me and one one other director, I think. It was, it was I mean, a, needless to say, this was a hotly con contested job this year. You're, it's kind of, you know, there's a, um, the audience is waiting for this. So that's a nice. For, for sure. Nice and so, yeah, exact, exactly. And I, But I just remember like, you know, knowing who the other person was and thinking like, okay, well, they're either going to take what I've got to offer or him because it's, we're nothing like one another. Oh, interesting. And, you know, I just had a very specific point of view of I'm going to do it my way. I'm, oh, I think you know, I remember this. Another great filmmaker, but a different kind of filmmaker. Yeah. Great, great filmmaker. Rhymes with Schmenet filler. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> okay. People yes. can do research if they want. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think he's fantastic. Oh, I nice really like money him. Ball, please. Um, yeah. I mean, structurally, it's, it's such a fascinating movie. I mean, I don't know what, what probably, you probably don't enter the arena until what, like 90 minutes into the, 80, 70, 80 minutes into the movie. So it's kind of like you're withholding. It's, it's a few different movies in one. It is. Yeah. And it, yeah, it was interesting structurally. And I remember working on this, um, and this is my first movie, but we started uh, a bit of a pattern, Suzanne and I, where when I was starting this 
this movie, there was no script. There was just a book. And there was a script that was due. And it came in right before I was going to go to New York to meet Suzanne. And originally, I was just going to meet her to kind of pick her brain about the world, get as much info out of her as I could. Um, and the script came in, and it wasn't the movie I certainly wanted to make. But I think everybody kind of felt the same. And we were sort of going to start over. And so my meetings with Suzanne turned into she and I going through the book and creating the beat sheet of what we thought the movie would be. And what was really tricky was was the section sort of leading up to this point. Mm -hmm. Because it was sort of clear like where she starts and Snow's visit and you got to go on the tour and you haven't proven yourself, you haven't done enough. But then there's this weird time where she goes back home. And for a long time, and in the book, there's this huge section of her back home and finding out she's going into games and them starting to train again. And and there's all the stuff with the wedding dress, her getting fit for the wedding. And um, and even Suzanne, funny enough, called it the cinematic dead zone. Oh, no. She knew <laughs> that in the book, that in the book, we can it cut was all this like, or, yeah, yeah. well, that we had to figure out how to get by it quickly. Yeah. But it was really tricky sort of getting to the point of like, but once you get here, it kind of started to well, you you know, get, find you, a groove. Yeah. And you find a groove as you start to also, we're, we're about to start to meet the, your new cast members. And yes. uh, it's, uh, they inject a lot of new, yeah. different life into the film. We shot in this hotel. It's the Marriott downtown in Atlanta. It's a very cool sort of interior of a hotel. And we shot there for two days. And we did this scene, and I think there's that elevator scene that everybody loves with Joanna Mason, where yep. she takes off her clothes. And um, and it's funny, because when we do that elevator scene with Joanna, we had sort of PAs sending the elevator up. It's a working hotel from the bottom to the top, where we sort of timed out the length of the scene. And the PA had at one point hit the wrong floor. So it went up, went out, went up, and Jenna had like, yeah, mind you, this is where she's stripping. Her, yeah, yeah, she yeah. pulled off her clothes and turned around to exit, and the door is open, and there was this this dude standing there with a Starbucks <laughs> cup, like waiting for the elevator. With a story and the for a lifetime. Opens, yeah. And there's basically a naked Jenna Malone, oh Jen, God. Woody, Josh, <laughs> a cameraman, like people holding lights. He was like, <laughs> I'm tripping, a deer something's in the happening. Yeah. Just like frozen. So we can we can start to talk about some of the casting because there was I mean I remember uh, let's let's start with Sam we're gonna we're yeah. about to meet him uh, yeah in a, in a you know kind of an iconic scene from the book yeah. um, Finnick was a big point for the fans they wanted to see you cast the right guy I love Sam Claflin he's fantastic in this how tough was it to find the right guy there were a lot of big names that were mentioned uh, it was it was tough. Uh, you know, we saw and read a lot of people. I would say we saw and read a lot of people for um, Joanna, too, for yeah. Jenna's role. Uh, and it was, you know, tough to find somebody that felt for Finnick like they had not just the good looks. There's a lot of good looking people in, you know, the acting world. But somebody that had the right kind of charisma, the charm, the sort of hint of, of irreverence, you know, the real acting chops, you know, in the end, you know, you may not know it here in this movie, but in the end, you want to really like them and kind of fall, fall in love with them. Um, so to find somebody that had kind of all those facets, it was really tricky. But then, you know, Sam came along and he was great. So can um, you confirm or deny any of the other names? There was talk of Taylor Kitsch, Garrett Hedlund, Army Hammer. Garrett, Garrett Hedlund um, I uh, met with for sure. I mean, it's so long ago now. I do not think he read for it, but I met with him. Mm -hmm. And then I also feel like there was a movie that I was attached to at the time, which was Unbroken, the oh, Zamperini sure. story. Yeah. And I felt like Garrett Hedlund only met with me because he wanted to. I think he wanted <laughs> to talk about about that and not this. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, but most of those other people I didn't meet. Okay, I didn't even meet with. It's a lot of fan casting. At That's the time my too. voice right there. Tributes mount up. Amazing. And another weird little story. There's if you look over the archways, the two tunnels that lead into where the chariots go, there are these little numbers. I think they say like PDL with a number. And those are the addresses of two clubs that all of us right there, PDL yeah. 738. And over the other one, those are addresses of clubs that we all used to go to in Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> so little 
Yeah, a little Inside nightlife joke. guide for yeah. those of you visiting Atlanta. So Jenna kills it in this role, clearly. Yeah. Um, so when she, we read a lot of people for Joanna. And I remember sitting um, in the casting director's office and Jenna was going to come in. And I don't know what had happened. I forget. Something had happened. And when Jenna came in, she was mad. (laughs) And she walked in and she was like, her face was like slightly red. And she seemed really annoyed. And she had this complete edge. And she really intimidated me. And like her performance was so great. And then I was like, at the end of the, the, you know, the few scenes we were doing, it's like, wow, that was great. And then all of a sudden she's like, oh, great. Thanks. Oh, wow. And then I totally laughed. I was like, oh my God. By the God. way, Jen's look in that elevator. Yes. Uh, no, that's great. <laughs> and that's just all, that's pure Jen. I, that's probably the most Jen. I was going to say that feels. That Katniss has yes, ever been. Totally. <laughs> so what a, what a pair of actors here. I know. I know. I love them so much. Yeah, Jeff Jeffrey and I, we met. I tried to get him to be in Constantine. And he and I met in Brooklyn once. And then he ended up taking, I think it was the Manchurian Candidate, Jonathan Demme's movie. Yep. So we didn't get to work together until here. And then Amanda Plummer, I've always just been such a huge fan of. Yeah, such a unique. And we just reached presence. out again. She was my first first choice. And we just reached out. And she's like, okay. Who are who are the filmmakers that made most of it uh, biggest impact? Is T- Terry Gilliam's another world builder? Are there, if you had to kind of like your your Mount Rushmore of filmmakers that made the biggest impact on your aesthetic, your approach? I don't know about my about my aesthetic. I mean, lots of people made an impact. You know, I mean, I grew up with the I'm sort of the Star Wars generation. Mm-hmm. So Star Wars as a kid, all the Spielberg movies, you know, Raiders, Jaws. Um, E.T. Close Encounters, that that stuff. Yeah. But I I will say my um, my parents split up when I was about 14. And most of the time I spent with my dad was going to the movies. And so when I was in high school, I saw he and I saw everything. And I remember being around 16 or so when Raising Arizona came out and Martin Scorsese's After Hours. Yeah. And those movies suddenly made me think of movies in a different way as not just entertainment, but but art. And it's kind of what drove me into um, studying film and looking into it actually as a career and not just something I liked to to watch. You mentioned Star Wars. I mean, there have to be like Empire has to come up in discussions when you're doing. When a, I did a this, section, it did. Right? It got brought up a lot um, when when people started having such a great reaction to this as a sequel. I think um, I remember in the you know doing the rounds of press for it that 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 kind of was coming up. Quite a bit. But you weren't actively thinking about it. As no, you, not really. at all. Because no. I feel like the, well, we'll get to it when we get to the end. I feel like the end in particular actually has Empire oh, really? vibes. Yeah. No, I wasn't thinking about it at all. I think in terms of movies that I referenced for this, the stuff I looked at the most were um, movies about the Vietnam War. And a lot of it was, you know, in terms of like sort of soldiers and PTSD and, you know, these on the most general level are about consequence of war. Yep. But also because it was in the jungle. So I was looking at things like Apocalypse Now and Platoon and... So where's your Star Wars movie? Have you had the Kathy Kennedy conversation? I have not. Really? No, no, I have not. You'd take that beating? You know, uh, honestly, I don't I don't think so. I don't. And, and just... Is that seeing what it's done to other filmmakers? No, just like... no, not not at all. I mean, had that been a conversation, you know, b- b- prior to JJ doing his first, I would have that would have been a really interesting and exciting conversation. But as soon as you know there's a plan for you know X amount of movies, you feel like you know that you're just one of right. fifteen, and you go, I don't know, it's 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 really hard to sort of pop out of the noise at that point, and that was purely it because you know. I think some of those new movies are fantastic. Let me set a scene for you guys, okay? Happy, sad, confused listeners, have you ever been in this predicament? You're looking desperately for that right doctor, the one that's near you, the one that a friend recommends, the one that just seems right, and oh my God, you found it. You found the doctor. They're actually near you. They're a specialist in the field that you need. And then you call the office, they've got an appointment, everything is great until you find out they don't take your insurance. I know. We've all been there. So wipe away your tears though. Put away the ice cream. 
head over to our sponsor, ZocDoc, right now to find and book a doctor who is right for you and, yes, takes your insurance. ZocDoc is a free app where you can find amazing doctors and book appointments online right now today. We're talking about booking appointments with thousands upon thousands of top-rated patient-reviewed doctors and specialists. You can filter specifically for ones who take your insurance, are located near you, and treat almost any condition you can imagine that you're searching for. If I need a doctor, I go to ZocDoc. Go to ZocDoc.com slash happy sad. Download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. Not yesterday, today. That's ZocDoc.com slash happy sad. ZocDoc.com slash happy sad. What is it like for you, I mean, having helmed these large-scale films, franchise films, you must always, well, Star Wars apparently not, but like otherwise, I'm sure you've been offered the Marvels, the DCs, or at least had those meetings. Is it a tough Is it a tough thing to kind of figure out? Like, it must be very attractive, certain things must be very attractive on paper, and then to then you have to figure out, is this worth two and a half, three years of my time? Yeah, that's, def- that's, that's I mean, that's definitely a part of it. I've honestly never been offered a Marvel thing. Really? Nope. Um, I've def- I've had meetings over the years with DC. I mean, I did, did a DC. Sure. Constantine was, you know, DC Vertigo. So I've meetings have had meetings with them over the years. But who's your favorite comic book character? Well, well besides Constantine, I was going to say it's Constantine. <laughs> um, <laughs> Who would you? Okay, they call with Wolverine or Superman. Or is there one that you would have a tough time saying no to? Francis, not we're really. giving you free reign. You can do what you want with this character. Really? No, not really. And and again, just because, you know, I feel like there's people that are like much better experts at Batman than sure. I am or Superman than I am. And um, I also have to say, and okay, look, Batman's probably the closest to my aesthetic mm-hmm. of the more mainstream comic book characters. I love Constantine. I lean toward the darker side of things um, personally. So that's why I, I love Constantine, you know, the kind of noir character and irreverent and has his demons. So if and when, I know we're way off topic, but if and when you get a chance to do another Constantine, which I know has been discussed. Yeah. Um, like how much of, of I, I love that film, but like, did that, was that in rep, that was your first film. I don't know if it was compromised in any ways, so if it felt like your undiluted vision, like what what's left on the table that you weren't able to do in the first Constantine? Well, the way that do? it was diluted was Constantine is definitely not a PG-13 character. And the thing, the sort of, you know, the big moment of selling out for all of us making that movie was saying yes to it being a PG-13 movie. If we said, no, 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 it's got to be R, we wouldn't have had nearly the amount of money we had to make it. So I get that. But the truth is, it's an R-rated character. But the problem was, we followed all of the rules for a PG-13 movie with that. And we still got an R. And there was no arguing. We went back and tried, and they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't even give us notes on how to change it. They just said, no, it's too intense. It has this sort of... It's almost a badge of honor. They're like, no, you've just made too dark a feeling of a movie. But the problem (laughs) is it really is a PG-13 movie. So I think what I feel is left on the table is we really are going to be able to do the R-rated version of Constantine. The like more sort of truthful, honest, you know, scary, like... If it was, if I was going to get an R, yeah. I would have made it an R-rated movie. <laughs> Wait, can we go back and shoot again? If you're yeah. only going to give me this R, yeah. So when you were making, the, at what point did you sign on for Mockingjay? Were you done with shooting already, or no. was it already? No. So when I, when I signed on to do Catching Fire, they had already had plans that you know I signed on in 2012, and they were like, Catching Fire is coming out November 13, Mockingjay one, November 14. Mocking J2, November 15. And I knew for them to hit those dates that they were actually going to have to start shooting the Mocking J movies before we even released Catching Fire. So I thought, well, this will be kind of weird because I'll be doing this. And then when we're in post, there's going to be some new director. It's kind of what happened with Star Wars, as I recall. Right? Yeah, it was like yeah. some new director is going to be around and they're going to be prepping. Yeah. And, you know, you know, because I thought, I mean, how are they going to hire me for two more sequels when they haven't even seen right. 
you know, any of what I've done yet in, in this. But for whatever reason, Nina and the studio, um, everybody was feeling so comfortable with the, the approach and my process that they actually asked me to do all the movies while we were still in prep on this. Oh, wow. And were you always totally on board with splitting them into two films? I mean, some some series have gotten flack no. over the years, but oh yeah, ours got flack. Yeah. I was I was not a big fan of doing it. I wish that we would have done just one complete movie. Um, and you know, jumping to Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes when I got involved in that, and that's the longest of the books. Uh, you know, the idea was, you know, should we split it? I was like, no way, <laughs> not doing that. No again. way. I don't care if it's a long movie. We're doing one standalone movie. I'm not taking shit for splitting the movie again. <laughs> so when you look at the two Mockingjay movies, do you feel it just would have been better served as one one story? 100%. Yeah. 100%. Um, just because it feels, and like I understand, you know, now, you know, you sort of, I don't know, maybe you sort of trick yourself into thinking that you're, you're telling these two sort of distinct stories, which we kind of are, but it still is a little manipulative, you know, that when you do a first half of a movie and then you're going to make people wait a year for a second half, I can see how it would annoy some. Right. As opposed to just doing a complete piece of work. And I'm so happy with this transition into the games, too. I really loved it. So you come off of this, like, really emotional and yeah. horrible scene of Cinna dying. And then she goes up this elevator. James is score. Yep. And then in IMAX, this is actually where the letterbox goes up. Yep. And this shot here, this was actually our last shot in Atlanta before we moved to Hawaii. Uh, goosebumps, Francis. It's a good moment. Yeah. <laughs> and then you reveal it. I'm so happy with the design of this, too. Yeah. Poor, poor oh Jen God. is just under duress for this entire movie. Yeah. She's. I remember there was, I don't remember if we left it in or not. I'm going to see, but there's a moment here where Peter comes back and Jen and Peter kiss for the first time and I remember one of the times because she was crying there was this huge glob of snot that was like <laughs> connected Who's between snot? I think hers because she's the one sobbing sure there, that so makes sense yeah yeah you know <laughs> for the snot gonna... can we see oh, there's oh no maybe no? we erased it or okay. used a different take but there was one where it was like and of course you know Jen's personality she's like show me it again <laughs> show me it again <laughs> so at the time we, we, we what would you say the degree of difficulty of this film was compared to something like I Am Legend or Constantine? Was this probably a bigger budget than those? Or was it or maybe not it I Am was, Legend? It was about the same size as I Am Legend, yeah. budget-wise. I mean, um, I Am Legend couldn't have been an easy film. <laughs> that's that's a challenge. No, I mean, what what's interesting about I Am Legend is that in general, I Am Legend, there's a simplicity to it because primarily it's a guy and a dog. Right. So, you know, whereas part of what's really difficult about these movies, you know, and even like looking at the Mockingjay movies, oh, the often I'm doing huge. sequences yeah. where every day I'm dealing with 14 actors. Yeah. So even if only two of them are talking, you still have 14 actors. You've got Julianne Moore, Phil Hoffman, Jeffrey Wright, like Woody Harrelson, all... <laughs> these huge actors that you know all need and i don't not just need attention but you know you have to talk to them about the sure, scene yeah. and blo help block and it's a lot plus you you know you get the sort of complications of big set pieces and things whereas like i am legend once you clear a street which is a big deal you're dealing with you know a guy and his dog <laughs> for the most part so just in terms of complication it was not nearly as complicated as as a movie like this. So if you didn't test screen this, it must have been a moment to the first time you saw it with an audience, like the premiere. You know, now, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm not sure I've ever seen this with an audience. What? Do, why, do you not like to do that? Uh, too too I nervous? I don't really. You should try it sometime. These are, these movies work with an audience. Yeah. No. <laughs> I've attended some of your premieres. They're fun. Yeah. Usually, <laughs> I I mean, I don't usually sit through any of the, any of my premieres. Usually, I like, you know, do the sort of intro or whatever, right. and then we go have dinner or something. <laughs> <laughs> so you've had some experience with people really like at the, at that kind of crazy fame level. I mean, again, Rob at Water for Elephants, that was madness. It was madness. <laughs> it was insane. It uh, was madness. I, I have to say, it was it was 
it was interesting because the first day I remember rolling up to set and we were shooting sort of northwest of Los Angeles and we were on this big private property and as I was pulling up to the sort of entrance gate I saw all these people with signs and because of all the animals we were using I was really scared and I initially thought oh man the animal activists are out day right. one and I thought it was going to be sort of PETA and we had made a deal too that we like we weren't using primates sure. and because you know they don't like using primates or elephants but we had an elephant and it was all Rob fans it was all Rob fans and they were there every day trying to get you know some sort of contact with him and then I remember at the end of the job we moved to Tennessee and shot in Chattanooga and there would be girls camped out in the hallways of our hotel yeah, no, and I've, they had yeah. put me in the room that normally Rob would have probably gotten, mm -hmm. so to throw them off. So every night I'd come back. Just <laughs> see the look of disappointment on many fans. But... They would be like, "Is he here?" I'm like, "No, he's not here." <laughs> Going in my room, there'd be like six girls sitting in the hallway, and obviously a hotel that's not used to dealing with stuff like that, so they're not wandering around with security. Jen was not happy with me about this scene, about... making her eat the raw fish. <laughs> <laughs> not a sushi got, fan not a no uh she ate sushi but i think there was something you know like when you're in a restaurant but we did get sushi grade fish it was a snapper and i had to prove to her that you could actually i see that, that yeah. you could eat it so i i took a nice chunk of it myself but <laughs> she still was really not happy about just like biting into a solid raw fish right i'll jump into i'll dive into water for you i'll fight made up baboons yeah. but i will not eat this raw fish yeah I forget. Are you? Do you like the ending that that went to theaters for I Am Legend? Or was... I prefer the original ending to the two that we have. Um, but the truth is, now I would have done and built it to be able to do the ending from the novella to truly just do that story. But I think you know, with the money being spent, everybody was nervous about doing something so nihilistic. Yeah. But looking back, I feel like everybody went to see The Last Man on Earth and enjoyed it for that reason and would have still enjoyed it with the nihilistic ending. Were you involved in all these kind of stop and starts of these sequels over the years, sequels, prequels? Um, or were you... I mean, you know, right after I did it, I was involved in trying to come up with a prequel sequel. Um, and then I remember then I was really out of it for a long time. And then I heard that they were just going to remake it like reboot it it's like wow that seems fast but okay aren't they now um, considering something with michael b like, yeah there's a there's a possible sequel that's out there now but you're not associated with that at least i've right been now. i've oh. been you know i've oh, been in okay. conversations but okay nothing i'm locked in on but we put um we built an island on a like a motorized um lazy susan and it spun around at like 25 miles an hour or something. I it mean, looks it. We'll, yeah. See, yeah, we'll see that in a minute. Everybody was, you know, putting on seasick motion sickness <laughs> wristbands and taking Dramamine. Were you at a comfortable safe distance or were you experiencing it as well? Uh, I mixed it up. <laughs> I didn't ride nearly as much as like the camera operator and the, yeah, here we the, go. And the actors. But we did it basically to, again, to be outside, but also so, you know, you get the idea of light sort of sure. shifting around. Like, I don't know what jo what uh, Josh had done prior to Hunger Games. That was a young guy. Josh so. is very, yeah, he's young. He's very athletic. I remember he got really excited in the fog sequence. We were shooting some running with a cable cam. And these cable cam guys have done lots of action sequences. And the great thing about that is they can go make it go really fast and track running. <laughs> And they told him that he was faster than Tom Cruise. Oh, and he was on. like, he wore that like a badge of honor <laughs> that he was running through the, at a speed that was faster than a Tom Cruise run. <laughs> and he was stoked about that. Weirdly, now that I'm remembering it, I feel like this sequence, not them at the beach, but this sequence may have been the first sequence she did having just come back from winning her Academy Award. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. It was like our startup to finish the two, the Hawaiian stuff. Well, she's like getting out all the award season angst. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Just... <laughs> yeah, I think it was a Tuesday because I, I think she Sunday night won the or... award Sunday night. Yeah. Monday, she went and got her hair dyed again mm. and then flew to Hawaii and was on set on Tuesday to do the sequence. Wow. 
deja vu moments when you started to shoot Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes? Yeah, I, ha I have to say that one of the the weirder things was, you know, it's 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 weird when you don't have any of the same cast right. back. Um, and, you know, we're shooting in new places and all this kind of stuff. And a lot of my crew was was back, which was great. But the, the first time I remember we were working with the stunt coordinator and the new cast um, for a rehearsal of the first sort of fight sequence in the arena. And I remember walking into the soundstage and everybody got moved to their positions and they were in the circle around the weapons. And I was like, okay, we're back. We're <laughs> back in Hunger the Games. Hunger Games. Yeah. I remember my first conversation actually with Jen. She was in Prague. She was shooting a movie. And I remember, I think she was talking to me from like a bathtub. And of course, you know, the average person meeting you for the first time wouldn't tell you they're in a bathtub. But Jen, of course, had to tell me she's in a bathtub. Every bodily function it's describing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but I, I did talk about how I really wanted to flesh out the relationships with both Pita and with Gail. And she was really nervous about it. Because I think she thought like that stuff was the most kind of YA yeah. of the material. And I had to sort of talk to her about kind of the reasoning and the stuff we talked about, about how, you know, the relationships are about shared experiences and not right. like high school dynamics. Well, again, I think it was it was suffering a little bit from the comparisons at the time. People were conflating it with the other YA franchises and it's, you know. It couldn't be more different than Twilight. But at the end of the day, it's not that. Yes. Um, yeah, and like and divergent too. You yeah. Know, for... Why do you think the YA? I mean, so many. You know, all filmmaking is cyclical. The Western comes and goes, et cetera. But like, YA, there were a lot of folks that tried and failed in, in the wake of these films. Was it just lesser source material? You know, that's what I think. I think it's lesser, lesser source material. I mean, I think that these hit because they're you're not actually dealing with like teenage stuff so because there's teenagers in it some people may view it that way but you're not right they're really about the the consequence of war in many facets of that right you know loss and you know you never come out without some kind of wound and ptsd and you know propaganda whatever you want to sort of talk about with it but they're not about sort of just like teen dynamics. And I think the problem is so much of why uh, YA is just about teen dynamics. Right. Funny, just like side story here. We initially in their first time in Hawaii tried to shoot this and we had this huge crane with this giant lighting rig because we had to create light that came in from the above the canopy of the trees. And we're in the middle of the jungle and this light rig goes up and the crane breaks down. They can't move it. They can't retract it. They can't do anything. So we end up shutting production down. This is when we went home and we had to do this our second time out. But they couldn't figure out how to get the crane down for a month. Oh, so this crane <laughs> sat in the middle of the jungle through storms. And that's actually Jen in that claw. She rode it all the way up. That's a hero shot right there. Yeah. But see, again, this stuff, this is all, this kind of imagery is all pulled from like Vietnam movies. Right. Sure. I remember there was like the low shot of the the basket with the body spinning from uh, like Jacob's Ladder. Even though it's not a Vietnam movie, yep. there's the Vietnam element. To... Was the ending kind of like just as scripted? Like you knew exactly how this was going to, the revelation, moment with Gail, yeah, her the face. Hard, the yeah, whole... yeah, the hardest thing was was, um, and Michael Arndt wrote this draft with us, um, who's great, and he's great at endings. And what we really worked on was the idea of shooting shooting the, um, the shield out, right? So it's like, what all builds up to that? Because that's a whole different epiphany where you're sort of, you've got remember who real enemy is and connecting it back and the bracelet that Effie had given that he now has and sort of the math of all of that to leading up yep. to not shooting him, shooting the shield. Yep. And, and like I said, no that, dialogue. You're just kind of like in her totally. head. Like and she just looks and yeah. Yeah. And trying to understand that, that was like what we really, really, really focused on. This sort of just all made sense from the book, what it was going to be and leading into this. That's a cliffhanger. Yeah. You should make a sequel. Yeah, exactly. Well, we made two. <laughs> you did. <laughs> Amazing.
Well, that was fun to watch. That was amazing. Yeah. Um, anything? So you're feeling good. I think you should feel good 10 plus years out. I do feel good. I think I feel better about it now than I did when it first came out. Good. Well, okay. Your your therapy session is over, sir. Yeah. Uh, congratulations again, and some cold play on the way out. Yeah. Um, Francis, thanks for the time, man. This movie is fantastic. Um, I'm so excited you came back for one more go around. Um, and yeah, we could we could do this with all your films. Constantine next. Let's do it. I I would ha be happy to do Constantine. Amazing. All Although right. there would be some effects in that, I'd probably cringe at too. But I'll make it all the more fun. A lot I love about that one. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for the time. All right. Man. Thanks, man. If you want more of this watch along for The Hunger Games Catching Fire, me and Francis Lawrence, well, patreon.com slash happy sad confused is where it's at. You can watch and enjoy the entire film alongside Francis and me right now. And so ends another edition of Happy, Sad, Confused. Remember to review, rate and subscribe to this show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm a big podcast person. I'm Daisy Ridley and I definitely wasn't pressured to do this by Josh. Ha <laughs> ha